morning. Thank you. In particular, I thank you that people who come to the first session and make it reasonably on time should all be given medals. Uh, I trust uh, many of you were here last evening uh, when Professor Maranovich uh, uh, discussed the Ukrainian descent, Helsinki groups, and many other topics, but began his discussion with a word of thanks to people abroad who worked for the dissident movement, who helped them, who kept their contacts with the world. Uh, and uh, this morning, we have three such people who will be addressing us on problems of nonconformism and dissent, a historical overview. Uh, that is, they will be telling uh, the history of, uh, of the dissident movement and particularly contacts with the West, but in all three cases, they will be telling a bit of their own personal history as well. Our first speaker will be, there will be three speakers, regrettably Oris Dechikiewski could not be here today, uh, and uh, it'll give us a little more time for discussion. Uh, and uh, our first speaker will be Kristina Isayu, Vice Chair of the Ukrainian Human and Civil Rights Committee and former Director of Human Rights Commission, Ukrainian World Congress from 1972 to 1996. And she will be giving an, a general overview of the Ukrainian dissident movement and context and efforts in the West. Thank you, Frank. Good morning. Uh, originally, I was going to talk about my own 25 years of work, but um, as I started putting thoughts down on paper, I felt a bit like a veteran um, revisiting old battlegrounds. And as one does, uh, almost every step of the way became sacred, so how does one choose uh, uh, the important issues? Um, in this overview, I hope that I will touch upon most of the important issues and then casework perhaps can come out during questions and answers. <coughs> Initially, Soviet def def uh, am I heard? Good enough? Initially, Soviet dissent was very little known in the West, and the Soviet dissident movement extended well beyond the movement for human rights. It was a movement of many and varied active civic communities which opposed the official Soviet ideology. There were the national and religious dissenters, there was the movement for social and economic justice, such as the dissent of the free trade unions, for example. The deported nations movement, the most prominent of these were the Crimean Tatars and the Mesky dissenters. There was the movement for immigration, like the Jewish and German dissenters, and of course, then there was the human rights movement. These movements did not occur simultaneously. Each had its own process of development, and as we look back for the sake of perspective, we see that the groups who were first to organize protests to the authorities were the deported nations, and some were permitted to return. For instance, the Kalmyks, the Chechens, the Ingush, the Balkans, and others. In 1956, it was the Crimean Tatars and the Mesky from southern Georgia and the Volga Germans who sent their representatives to Moscow with requests to re be able to return to their homelands. These were the first so-called all-national movements in the USSR. Among the republics within the Soviet Union, the first movement to emerge in the 1960s was the Ukrainian movement with its aspiration to resist Russification and to insist on equal rights and democratization for Ukraine. In the Baltic republics, the Lithuanian Catholic movement in the beginning of the 1970s was widespread and perhaps most well organized, and we saw the emergence of Armenian and Georgian descent with the Russian national movement appearing also in the 1970s. Each of these movements was unique and developing with almost no knowledge of the others. Sorry. Even though, better? Um, even though there was common goal, there was a common goal. We saw, for example, that although problems of the Ukrainian Catholic Church resembled those in Lithuania, the movements initially knew nothing about each other. Similarly, the national and religious movements within the Soviet bloc lacked information about each other for obvious reasons. The dissenters were unable to circumvent the strict control of the monolithic nature of the Soviet society. 
with time, the only linking role for the descent of this heterogeneous society was taken up by the human rights movement. Because of its universal orientation with respect to religion, politics, ethnic origin, and especially its emphasis on the rights of the individual, the human rights movement became the natural focus for all dissenters. December 5, 1965, was considered the birth date of the human rights movement, with the first public demonstration in Moscow's Pushkin Square, and the slogan, respect the Soviet constitution, quote, unquote. Interesting to note that another movement demanding observance of the provisions of their constitution was growing in, at the same time across the Atlantic. The Soviet dis, uh, dissident movement and the US civil rights movement produced in such very different places activists with similar social impulses who's, who rose to inspire such large and compelling protests demanding the provisions of their constitution be observed. The mechanism of the Soviet dissent was the Samizdat. In the post-Stalinist era and with the temporary easing of censorship in 1960, in the 1960s, there came an irreversible effect on the minds and social life of the young people in the USSR, self-expression, and this movement found a vehicle, a method of disseminating ideas and information in self-publishing. The Samizdat was the core of the movement. It became unique as a mass phenomenon and the basic means of self-knowledge and self-expression. Inefficient as it was, unlike, unlike the digital d descent of today, uh, it attracted talented writers, fearless distributors, and a huge readership that later extended all the way to the West. The history of the carbon paper, Samizdat, deserves a session of its own, but anecdotally, Vladimir Bukovsky described it in, in this manner. I write it myself, censor it myself, print and disseminate it myself, and then I do time in prison for it myself. The Ukrainian national movement began in the 1960s with both uncensored and samizdat poetry and literature. Young Ukrainian poets, writers, and publicists gave the first impetus to the movement. Here was the rebirth, so to speak, of spiritual and intellectual expression and of independent public opinion, a time of cultural revival. Names of young intellectuals and artists like Vasil Stus, Ivan Svitlechny, Evhen Svarstyuk, Lina Kostenko, Ihor Kalenets, Alohorska, Stefania Shabatura, Svetoslav Karavansky, Ivan Zhuba, Valentin Moraz, Chernovil, and many, many, many others, came forth with a public challenge to the official line. The first wave of repressions came in 1965, when in August and September, simultaneously in various parts of Ukraine, more than 20 intellectuals were arrested, and the rest, as we say, is history. On September 1st, 1965, one of the first to be arrested was Valentin Moroz, and the diaspora community was compelled to react to the smuggled out Samizdat statements, one of which became a slogan for several, several groups of, of the um, Ukrainian community. I'm quoting, you wanted to hide people in the forests of Mordovia. Instead, you placed them on a stage for all the world to see. You, you hurled a stone at every spark of life on the Ukrainian horizon, and every stone became a boomerang." Unquote. In response to these arrests, in 1968, three members of the newly formed World Congress of Free Ukrainians, they called themselves at that time, proposed that a committee be formed in order to compile appeals, letters, and other d dissident uh, documentation and to provide this information to the existing international institutions concerned with human rights and humanitarian affairs. The evolution of this committee was long and arduous. There was much opposition to the approach based on merely human rights. But with the support of individuals like Senator Paul Yuzik, the academic Bogdan Bochurkiu, and the two metropolitans, Maxim Hermanyuk of the Catholic Church and Mstislav Skripnik of the Orthodox Church. The committee evolved to become the Human Rights Commission in 1972, functioning from 1973 to 1992. Simultaneously here in the United States and Canada and Australia, Various groups of a particular political orientation became active by forming committees in defense of Valentin Moroz. 
These were organized rather quickly. There was little coordination initially, and it, as a result, their publications, their leaflets, uh, their press releases, demonstrations suffered from this approach. Soon there arose another issue of concern and s somewhat of a dilemma for the Ukrainian diaspora, and that was the arrest of three persons, Vasily Romanyuk, an Orthodox priest, Leonid Plushd, who de described himself, and I quote, a Stalinist who works zealously in the Komsomol and offers his services for the KGB, becomes a neo-Marxist concerned with justice, equality, and dignity. He wrote this in his memoir, uh, Carnaval, History of Carnaval. And Major General Petro Horenko, a Red Army soldier who had organized the Union for, of Struggle for the Revival of Leninism. One can see how their political views would pose problems for the diaspora community. Just to give you an idea of what these men stood for, Vasily Romanyuk, born into a peasant family, was first arrested at age 19 in 1944 for quote-unquote national religious activity. And he was sentenced to 10 years of forced labor and exile while his family was deported to Siberia, where his father died and his brother was shot trying to escape. After rehabilitation in 1959, he completed short-term theological studies and served as a priest to various Orthodox congregations. He was again arrested during the mass arrests of Ukrainian intellectuals in January of 1972, charged with six, uh, Article 62, which was uh, in the criminal code, anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda. He served another 10 years in the Mordovian ASSR. He finally arrived in Toronto in July of 1988 after truly massive uh, campaigns on his behalf, and he was my Amnesty International adoptee. Leonid Plushd, a mathematician who in May of 1969, together with um, Henrik Antunian, an engineer from Kharkiv, joined the Moscow Initiative Group for the Defense of Human Rights in the USSR, established a systematic exchange of information and of some that material between Ukraine and Moscow. He collected new information and writings from Moscow, um, arranged for their duplication in Kiev, and then arranged for the translation of Ukrainian Chronicle into Russian. Um, and the Chronicle then was distributed in, uh, in, in Russian in Moscow. He also wrote letters of protest, of protest in defense of Valentin Moroz and was arrested in January 1972 and confined to four years uh, to a special psychiatric hospital charged with rampant schizophrenia, quote unquote. Um, he was there four years um, and he came to the West in 1976, January of 1976. Petro Horenko, a highly decorated major general in the Red Army, a staunch defender of the Crimean Tatars, and later one of the founding members of the Ukrainian Helsinki group, arrested in Tashkent in 1969, diagnosed with pathological development of personality, quote unquote, and incarcerated in special psychiatric institutions. He was, uh, formally his troubles began in 1961 when he criticized Khrushchev. He was then transferred to the Far East, where he became active in calling for a revival of, Stalin, uh, of Leninist principles, for which he was arrested in 1964, examined an, in the notorious Serbsky Institute of Forensic Psychiatry in Moscow, pronounced mentally ill and forcibly hospitalized for 14 months. Having lost his military pension, Rehorenko had to work as a porter and a longshoreman. In 1969, he flew to Tashkent to serve as a defense witness in the trial of Crimean Tatar dissenters. There was a massive um, uh, crackdown on, on the Tatars at that time. He was arrested and was uh, confined to various psychiatric institutions for more than four years. And in 1977, he was granted a visa to, uh, for medical reasons to come to New York. It's important to know that although Rehorenko's dissent was not based on concern with issues like russification, he was most concerned with the cultural genocide and ethnocide that began in 1930s in Ukraine. His membership in the Ukrainian Helsinki group later provided very close contacts 
with the Moscow Helsinki Group. And under, the influ under his influence, the first report of the Ukrainian Helsinki Group was issued by the Moscow Group. There they noted that under the conditions existing in Ukraine, the formation of a Helsinki Watch Group in Ukraine was an act of great courage, that its initiatives um, and activities were greatly hampered by the absence of any diplomatic representatives in Kyiv or any Western correspondence that could help them. Uh, the Moscow Group also uh, declared then that they would help the Ukrainian Group to send information to journalists and Western signatories of the Helsinki Final Act. So, in the wake of the massive arrests in 1972 and the diverse backgrounds of the dissidents, the Ukrainian diaspora community could no longer limit itself to the defense of only one persuasion of dissident, and the Moros Committee expanded, therefore, and other groups and individuals became active, uh, like the Committee for the Defense of Soviet Political Prisoners, uh, the Americans for Human Rights Committee, the Smaller Skip Publishers, um, and many, many others. It became incumbent upon the Ukrainian World Congress at this time to become seriously committed to the defense of so many intellectuals, priests, and workers arrested in connection with the national democratic movement in Ukraine. We soon discovered that as a result of these arrests, publications of the Ukrainian Herald ceased for two years, communication with Moscow suffered, and in November of 1972, the Chronicle of Current Events stopped publication for over a year. Information was hard to compile at that time, but according to reliable sources in Moscow, the number of names on file of those who were arrested in Ukraine was 122 individuals. But it was said that the actual number was much larger. In retrospect, um, my own sh files show that there were close to 200 persons arrested then. Senator Paul Yuzik pressed very hard for the allocation of funds from the large membership of the UWC, the Ukrainian World Congress, and fought for a commitment to establish a permanent office for the defense of human rights. Representatives of 231 organizations in the West attended a session of the Second World Congress of Free Ukrainians in November of 1973. I think it was here in New York City. There, they passed a resolution to establish the Human Rights Commission with the aim to coordinate monitoring of events in Ukraine and to develop sustained pressure of international public opinion in defense of the dissidents. Senator Yuzik asked me to join in the work at that time, um, partly because I was coordinating the Soviet uh, adoptees for AI in Canada. Two events gave considerable impetus to the development of my work. These were the signing of the Helsinki Accords in, 19, in August 1975, and the creation by an act of Congress of the U.S. Congressional Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, as we know at the CSC Commission. Artists would have uh, provided a full picture of their very important function, but I feel the need to give, give you only an idea of how the Commission worked in the years that led up to the 1990s. It was, and still is, an independent agency composed of 21 legislative and executive branch officials charged with monitoring and encouraging compliance of the signatory states with the Helsinki Final Act. Its initial mandate was to convene public hearings with expert witnesses on such issues as status of Soviet Jewry, German unification, developments in the Baltics, East-West trade, and progress in the so-called human dimension. It issued periodic reports, held still still do, uh, hold periodic meetings with officials of the executive branch on the CSCE, now the OSCE policy and, implement, uh, and implementation, participate in planning and ec in, in the execution of U.S. policy in various CSC fora, and they took up human rights casework, which is very important to us. They compiled and disseminated information and advised congressional offices and interested non-governmental organizations on ways to resolve them. So, although the Helsinki Final Act was not legally binding, but because it was signed by the heads of state, it represented a political commitment. And we, the NGOs, had a vehicle and a me mechanism to participate in this highly political process. And so we did from 1980 to about 1992, 93. 
We at last, uh, at last could leave behind the symbolic activities of protest rallies, demonstrations, petitions, letter writings, and begin to build a participatory defense strategy. The Helsinki Final Act provided, as we all know, Principle 7, dealing with the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, which Western groups used when lobbying their own governments. And a year later, in November 1976, the Ukrainian Helsinki Group was formed in Kiev. The group announced itself openly, spelled out its principles and demands, and made public its membership. Activities for the first time uh, sorry, activists uh, in the group for the first time felt that they had a, comp a compelling moral, legal, and political ground to demand that not only that the Soviet government uphold human rights as guaranteed by the Constitution in international and international covenants, but that the Western democracies intervene and support their struggle for human and national rights. <coughs> From 1976, my office took on the role of lobbying both the Canadian and the U.S. governments, and to some extent the uh, Europeans, although they were not very am amenable to that, uh, the Helsinki signat signatories. Although compiling and verifying data on each dissident was very slow and arduous task, even though we used reliable, res uh, reliable sources. We used the Ukrainian Herald, Visnik, which started coming out in 1971. The Chronicle of Current Events, uh, I think its first publication was 1968. The Amnesty International publication of Prisoners of Conscience in the USSR, which was a very useful tool, um, came out in 1975, uh, the first copy. And, of course, Kronid Lubarsky's USSR News Brief became a virtual Bible for us. Um, its first publication was November 1978. Slowly, some of the dissidents came themselves, and um, they appeared in the West and were able to update and enlarge our information. Compiling and translating dissident statements, documents, and their prosecution uh, statements, letters, and so on, became also a focus for several groups in the community. Um, such were the Committee for the Defense of Soviet Political Prisoners with uh, Adrian Karatnitsky and the late Roman Kupczynski, um, who were very much involved, small skip publishers, uh, prologue publishers, and uh, Marko Tsarinnik and many others. My office produced numerous briefs, monographs, booklets, and news releases with which we inundated the offices of politicians and the media. But very quickly it became evident that in order to help government to yield to our concerns, uh, Western governments to yield to our concerns, we needed stronger pressure. We formed various alliances. In Canada, the Captive European Nations Council for, formed. Um, early 1982, I think, comprised of Belarusian, Czechoslovak, Estonian, Hungarian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Polish, Slovak, and Ukrainian national representatives. Although continuing our work with adoption cases in uh, Amnesty International, we also joined with the Interreligious Task Force on Soviet Jewelry, which later became the Interreligious Task Force on Human Rights. And from 1980s, the CSC Commission became a very important liaison for the NGOs. This enabled us to participate in the many international uh, CSC Helsinki for, uh, meetings in the years to follow. There were some 11 meetings hosted by various uh, signatory governments, um, all dealing with human rights, cultural heritage, national minorities, human contacts, information, and then ending in the Moscow final meeting on the human dimension in 1991. My office had a continuous presence at, this, at these meetings, often participating with other NGO groups to hold press conferences, symposia, exhibits, etc., and thus mirroring the diversity of human rights concerns. We also met with the Soviet delegation often. In the early years, merely confrontationally, but in the late 1980s, as the Soviet dis uh, Soviets decided to be more ac accessible, 
I often met with the head of the delegation to discuss unresolved dissident cases. I always presented them with lists of Ukrainians still remaining in prison and discussed, really debated the inhumanity of psychiatric abuse. And the Ukrainian Catholic Church was always a looming, unresolvable dilemma on their horizon as well as ours. I'm almost out of time, but I thought that I might it might be interesting to briefly sketch two examples of work of my commission that had a lasting influence. One was the establishment of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Human Rights in Canada, uh, and the other was the U.S. State Department's publication of a white paper, uh, The Soviet Repression of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. I, I brought a copy of it here. Um, after seven long years of sustained lobby and relentless pressure that we coordinated together with the Captive European Nations Council, the Canadian government in its very slow deliberation at last found the necessary mechanism in June 1987 to form the Standing Committee on Human Rights. Um, it's first, before that they, they dealt very peripherally with the NGOs and with the material that we, that we presented them. We wanted something comparable to what the CSC Commission in, in Washington was. Um, its first report to the House of Commons appeared only a year later in June 1988. And this report gave a justification for the, for the inception of this, of this committee and stated, among other pronouncements, that, I quote, international human rights law imposes both domestic and international obligations on states. The development of these obligations constitutes a major departure from the general principles of international relations, whereby states are not to intervene in one another's affairs in violation of national sovereignty over in interna internal matters. But under the post-World War international human rights legal regime, states are entitled to address human rights abuses in other states, unquote. And it went on to stay, say that the committee undertook this study because of the ongoing follow-up meeting in Vienna and the political developments behind the Iron Curtain. And this report addresses those matters which appear to require the most urgent resolution. If I remember correctly, Three of the uh, uh, Ukrainian Helsinki monitors died during that time, and the uh, Western uh, community was was uh, beginning to deal differently with, with, with the Soviet delegation. In Washington, following several of my fortuitous meetings with the head of the U.S. delegation to the CSCE, the U.S. State Department decided that it would be advantageous to publish a special report, the White Paper, as they called it in January 1987, on the Soviet repression of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. I was asked to provide a, a text for this publication, and interestingly, this was one on, uh, only of two such special uh, publications that came out by the uh, Bureau of Public Affairs. The other one was a report on the situation in Cuba. Uh, Richard Shifter, then Secretary of State for Human Rights, and Roger Pilon, the policy director for the Bureau, felt that such a publication might sway the Catholic clergy to become more uh, involved through the Vatican delegation to the CSCE. Also, this was on the eve of the millennial celebrations of Christianity, with Moscow, uh, which Moscow was promoting very vigorously. Um, uh, we recall also that Pope John Paul II was a strong moral and political support for the Catholics in Poland. Therefore, the thinking of the State Department was that public support of the Roman Catholic Church for its Eastern Rite Church in the Soviet Union might provide important pressure and political leverage. An interesting aside, as events developed, the Cardinal, um, uh, Cardinal um, Aaron Jean-Marie Lustiger of, of France went on uh, to, uh, uh, he was, he was a, um, an advisor to, to the Vatican, and he went on an ecumenical journey to Moscow in May of 1989. Um, upon arrival there, he was barred from visiting Kiev, uh, the, the capital of Rus, the cradle of Christianity, as he put it. 
The Russians told him that he could not visit Kiev because the then representative of Russian Orthodoxy, um, Metropolitan Filaret, was not there. The cardinal and his entourage immediately returned to Paris, where the press called his departure from Moscow a slap in the face for the Russians. I had the pleasure of uh, meeting and, and speaking with uh, the late cardinal for quite some time uh, and discuss the, the issues of Ukrainian uh, Catholics. His thoughts at that time were that Ukrainian Catholicism posed an unresolvable problem for Russia. I think my time is up. I'm going to end here. Because I um, didn't have time to go in, into cases, I brought um, uh, some interesting psychiatric abuses and, and other cases for those of you who would like to uh, look at them and, and peruse. And, uh, and one another thing, I think Mr. Marinovich is here. Uh, this was one of our first publications uh, on the uh, persecution of the Ukrainian Helsinki group. And there's a very nice photograph of a very young Mr. Marinovich. He's still young. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jerry Labor, one of the founders of Human Rights Watch. Her memoir, The Courage of Strangers, Coming of Age with the Human Rights Movement, was published by Public Affairs in 2002. She will be speaking on the question of Russian slash Soviet, I guess, with you all. Dissidents, obviously one of our problems of how to typify them. And of course, we'll deal with other dissident groups by nationality within the Soviet Union. Thank you. Is this working properly? In the early 1950s, when I was a student here at the uh, now called Harriman Institute, then the Russian Institute, we used to put Soviet write writings under a microscope, reading between the lines, seeking for any small sign of dissent. We found very little. During the Stalin period, any isolated voice of a dissent was quickly and ruthlessly stifled. The repression itself remained virtually undocumented behind the tightly closed Iron Curtain. This changed briefly but dramatically in 1956 with Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech to the 20th Communist Party Congress in which he detailed the crimes of the Stalin era. It was a stunning moment in history. The party leader himself, a former henchman of Stalin's, described a climate of fear in which legions of people were arrested almost at random many on the basis of anonymous accusations made to settle some everyday score. Under Khrushchev, hundreds of thousands of political prisoners were released. They told of an enormous network of prisons and labor camps where inmates suffered from forced labor, brutal cold, torture, and starvation. Khrushchev's speech ushered in a brief period known as the Thaw, it took its name from a 1954 novel by Ilya Ehrenberg, which, tame as it was, departed from the dictates of socialist realism. <coughs> Other revealing novels followed, most notably Alexander Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, the first officially published novel to describe the daily horror of life in a Stalin labor camp. The thaw also sparked the first known instances of public protest in the Soviet Union. In 1960, a group of young people organized public readings of literature in Mayakovsky Square. The organizers included Alexander Ginsburg, Yuri Golanskov, Edward Kuznetsov, Vladimir Osipov, and Vladimir Bukovsky activists whose names would later become well known in the annals of Soviet dissent. The readings they organized were soon forbidden, and many of the organizers were arrested or sent to mental hospitals. By 1964, a strong backlash was underway, and in October of 64, Khrushchev was ousted from power. He was replaced by Brezhnev, who reestablished ruthless repression for the next 18 years until his death in 1982. 
The end of the thaw was signified by the arrest and subsequent trial in 1965-66 of two very respected Soviet writers, Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Daniel, who had dared to criticize the Soviet system in satirical literature published abroad under pseudonyms. Sinyavsky in particular, publishing under the name Abram Turtz, wrote an essay entitled, What is Socialist Realism? It was so startling in its criticism that many in the West suspected it was actually written by someone in the West, perhaps a Soviet emigre. It included the following passage. So that prisons should vanish forever, we built new prisons. So that all frontiers should fall, we surrounded ourselves with a Chinese wall. So that work should become a rest and a pleasure, we introduced forced labor. So that not one drop of blood be shed anymore, we killed and killed and killed. Sometimes we felt that the on only one final sacrifice was needed for the triumph of communism, the renunciation of communism. Sinyavsky was sentenced to seven years of hard labor and Daniel to five. Their trial, meant to intimidate Soviet citizens, served instead to mobilize dissent. Although the trial was closed to the public, foreign journalists milled around outside, together with a small group of activists, friends and supporters of the writers on trial. Articles appeared in the Western press about these supporters, many of whose names we were hearing for the first time in this context. One was Andrei Sakharov, the outstanding physicist known as the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. Another was Larissa Bogoraz, the former wife of Yuli Daniel. There was even a retired general, Pyotr Grigorenko. For many, this was considered the start of the Soviet human rights movement. It also marked the beginning of regular Samizdat publishing. In January 1968, four young Soviets were tried and sentenced for compiling a white book on the sinyavsky daniel trial. An underground publication, The Chronicle of Current Events, continued to appear, giving factual reports on arrests and persecutions, and printing the texts of petitions and appeals. In August 1968, Soviet-led troops invaded Czechoslovakia and put an end to the exciting reforms of the Prague Spring. In Moscow, seven unbelievably courageous people mounted a protest against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia by demonstrating in Red Square. I think it's worth a moment to consider what they did. Seven ordinary people, one wheeling her baby in a carriage, entering the vast and heavily policed expanse of Red Square, waiting for a prearranged signal to display their placards and a homemade Czech flag that they had hidden under their coats. They knew, of course, that they would be arrested, and they were, immediately. One of the demonstrators was Larissa Bogoros. She was a legendary figure to me long before we actually met. She was married twice to two pro prominent Soviet dissidents. The first was the writer Yuli Daniel. The second was the much imprisoned worker activist Anatoly Marchenko, author of My Testimony, who died from a hunger strike in Chistopol prison in 1986 on the eve of major reforms. Larissa herself spent four years in Siberian exile where she worked in a sawmill carrying heavy logs. She lived in a tiny log cabin, bought with money raised by her friends in Moscow. I developed a stomach ulcer there, she told me. My health was ruined. After the demonstration in Red Square, before she was taken off to a fort of a prison, Louisa sent the following letter to a friend, explaining her de decision to demonstrate. Don't criticize us as others criticize us. Each of us made this decision for himself because it has become impossible to live and breathe. I cannot even think about the Czechs. As I hear their pleas on the radio, I cannot stay silent. I cannot keep from shouting. <laughs> 
1969, an initiative group for the defense of human rights was formed. In 1970, a committee for human rights was organized. The police destroyed them both. Their members were arrested, sent to labor camps, or in some cases to psychiatric hospitals, where they were administered mind debilitating drugs. By the early 1970s, human rights activities in the USSR seemed at a virtual standstill. Then, in 1974, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago was published abroad. Copies of the book circulated in Samizdat in the Soviet Union. It was a unique, exhaustive work documenting every aspect of the labor camp network. It shook the foundations of Soviet society and brought home to Soviet citizens and to all of us the full scope of Stalin's terror. In 1975, the Soviet government signed the Helsinki Final Act. Eager for this agreement, which acknowledged the post-war borders of the Soviet bloc, the Brezhnev government also agreed to the human rights provisions embodied in the Helsinki Accords, including the rights of citizens to know and act upon their rights. The Helsinki Accords were published in full in Pravda. Something unanticipated followed. Courageous citizens in Moscow decided in May of 1976 to form a Moscow Helsinki group and to report on their government's compliance with the Helsinki Accords. Other Helsinki groups soon followed in Ukraine and Lithuania in November 1976, in Georgia in January 1977, and in Armenia in April 1977. Groups were also formed in Poland, the Workers' Defense Committee known as CORE, and in Czechoslovakia, Charter 77. An attempt to form a Helsinki group in Romania was immediately quashed. The Moscow group was led by Yuri Orlov, a phys physicist in his early 50s with curly red hair and an impish smile. In its first few months, the group compiled several thousand pages on human rights abuses in their country. The reports were released in Moscow at press conferences attended only by the foreign press. They were circulated abroad and at home in Samizdat. Nine months later, the arrests began. Orlov was among the first to be taken in February 1977. By the end of March, Alexander Ginsburg and Anatoly Sharansko had been arrested, along with Alex Satiki and Mykola Rudchenko of the Ukrainian Helsinki Committee. Orlov was sentenced to seven years in strict regimen labor camp to be followed by five years of internal exile. Sharansky, charged with espionage, was sentenced to 13 years of imprisonment and forced labor. Rujenko was sentenced to seven years in the camps and five years in internal exile. <coughs> Ginsburg was sentenced to 11 years, Tiki to 15. These were just the first in a long line of arrests. The victims, ironically, had done nothing more than call attention to the persecution of others. In September 1979, I went to Moscow to meet with members of the Moscow Helsinki Group. We had recently formed the U.S. Helsinki Watch, which ultimately grew to become Human Rights Watch. I wanted to tell the Moscow Helsinki Group members of our existence and to assure them that our group knew of their troubles and that we were doing our best to publicize them and to help them. Officially, I was in Moscow to accompany an exhibit at the Moscow Book Fair. No one knew my real purpose was to meet with the Helsinki group. My contacts in Moscow were Andrei Sakharov and his wife, Elena Bonner. Sakharov was the youngest person ever to be elected to the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He had been given all the privileges of the scientific elite money, chauffeur-driven cars, a nice apartment, access to special medical care. But he began to question what he was doing. He became concerned about the hydrogen bomb he had helped create, its power to destroy people and to ravage the environment. He raised his concerns at meetings and in letters 
this got him into serious trouble. Eventually, he lost his job and his privileges. This did not deter him. He began to speak out even more about the many injustices in Soviet society, about people in prison for exercising free speech, about brutal prison conditions, about the constant surveillance of the population by the secret police. Elena Bonner, a medical doctor, came from a family that had suffered greatly under Stalin's repression. She was a founding member of the Moscow Helsinki Group. Bonner suggested that I wait until my last, the last day of my visit in Moscow to meet with the Helsinki Group. Once you meet with us, she told me, you will be followed everywhere by the police. It's better not to call attention to yourself until you're ready to leave for home. I followed her advice. On the day I was to leave Moscow, I went to the soccer of apartment for the meeting. I took my suitcase with me so I could go straight to the airport after the meeting was over. I went alone. None of my pub publisher colleagues or the American journalists who had accompanied me everywhere else wanted to risk being present at a Helsinki group meeting. And who were these Helsinki people with whom it was so dangerous to meet? Only about a dozen of them were left, mainly women and elderly women at that. Two of them, Oksana Meshko, 75, and Malva Landa, 62, had defied travel bans to meet with me. Meshko, from the Ukrainian Helsinki group, had spent eight years in prison, and Landa was banned from Moscow for having helped distribute funds sent by Solzhenitsyn to help the families of political prisoners. Also present was Sofia Kalistratova, 73, an ailing retired lawyer, Naum Maimon, 69, a former scientist and refusenik. A young couple in their 20s, Ivan Kovalyov and Tatyana Osipova, were the son and daughter-in-law of Sergei Kovalyov, an early activist who was serving a long prison term. Although the room was bugged, they all spoke openly, describing their colleagues in prison and their own persecution and harassment. I noticed that only one word caused them to lower their voices to a whisper. That word was Helsinki. Because the people in the room were mainly old and female, I assumed they were beyond the ominous reach of the KGP. But just a few months later, in January 1980, the Sakharovs were exiled to the closed city of Gorky. Oksana Meshka, at the age of 78, was sentenced to a strict regimen labor camp and internal exile. Ivan and Tanya, who wanted to help Sergei Kovalyov, were themselves sent to prison and labor camp. More than 50 Helsinki activists were known to be in prison in the Soviet Union. I, by the way, was banned by the Soviet government from any further travel to the USSR. <coughs> in September 1982, the Moscow Helsinki Committee announced that it was disbanding. The three remaining members, all elderly, were no longer able to withstand the constant police pressure. The next few years were very grim. In March of 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the new party leader and launched a policy of glasnost, or openness. Dramatic changes began. <coughs> In October of 85, Elena Bonner was given permission to leave Gorky for open heart surgery in Boston. In February 1986, Anatoly Sharansky was released in a prisoner for Soviet spy exchange and allowed to leave for Israel. In September 1986, Yuri Orlov was released from exile and sent to the United States, part of another prisoner for spy exchange. In December 1986, Andrei Sakharov was released from exile in Gorky and allowed to return to Moscow. Gorbachev himself called Sakharov by phone to tell him the news. Several hundred political prisoners were released in January 1987, and more releases continued throughout the year. <coughs> 
By the end of 1987, about half of the known political prisoners had been released. The Soviet government stopped jamming Western radio stations and began allowing people to emigrate. And with these changes, an avalanche of new organizations formed, tens of thousands of them, from gardening groups to mothers of Soviet soldiers to advocates for the disabled. A vibrant civil society developed in the Soviet Union almost overnight. In 1987, a new human rights group called the Press Club Glasnost was formed by Lev Timofeyev, an economist and journalist who had been released from prison in February. Another former prisoner, Sergei Grigoryans, began publishing Glasnost magazine. An independent association called Memorial was allowed to form, initially to build a monument to the 20 million victims of Stalin. It later went on to become a human rights organization with branches throughout the USSR. It remains one of the most active human rights organizations in Russia today. Gorbachev's announcement that the Soviet Union would no longer interfere in the policies of other communist countries shook the communist leaders in Eastern Europe and gave impetus to repress dissidents in those countries. Within the course of one momentous year, 1989, communist states in six countries, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, East Germany, and Romania, collapsed with hardly a struggle in the face of popular revolutions that were, with the exception of Romania, astonishingly peaceful. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary people took to the streets in countries with indigenous human rights movements like Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary. Dissidents who had fought the human rights struggle for decades found themselves thrust into power. These new governments soon outpaced the Soviet Union in reforms. It would be another two years before we would see the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and the end of the Soviet Union itself. Meanwhile, as Gorbachev and Yeltsin battled for power and the Soviet republics fought for their independence, former dissenters such as Andrei Sakharov and Sergei Kovalyov as newly elected deputies to a new Soviet parliament, found a platform for which to express their views. People throughout the Soviet Union were speaking out as never before. Back in the 1970s, when members of the Moscow Helsinki group were being arrested and sent to prison, one of the founding members of the group, Ludmila Alexeyeva, was given a one-way visa and emigrated to the United States. She was designated by the Moscow group to be their official spokesperson abroad. For 15 years, she worked tirelessly on behalf of her imprisoned friends, serving as a part-time consultant to the U.S. Helsinki Watch, broadcasting on Radio Liberty, and writing several definitive works on Soviet dissent. In the 1990s, she returned to Moscow, where she reorganized the Moscow Helsinki Group along the lines of the Western human rights group she had worked with in the past. She remains its chair and helps direct its work against the many human rights abuses in today's Russia. In 2006, she invited me to speak at a conference organized by the Moscow Helsinki Group on the occasion of its 30th anniversary. I came away impressed by the efficiency and dedication of the many new young members of the group. I also remember a statement made from the podium by the venerable human rights activist, Larissa Bogoroz, which I will paraphrase here as an apt description of the state of human rights activism in Russia today. In the old days, Larissa said, they were afraid of what we said and would not let us speak. Now we can speak, but they are not listening. Thank you. Our third speaker will be Anna Protzik, who is professor of history at Kingsborough College of the City University of New York. 
She is the author of Russian Nationalism and Ukraine, the Nationality Policies of the Volunteer Army During the Civil War, as well as numerous studies on modern nationalism in Eastern Europe. She is preparing for publication a monograph on the influences of Giuseppe Mazzini's political thought in the Slavic world. She's been involved in the work of Amnesty International since 1968, and she will be speaking about Ukrainian descent as seen through work in Amnesty International and West Western Press. Thank you. And please go to the podium because uh, our, uh, our cameraman tells us we, we need you I to wish, go a okay, little too far you. over. Yes. yes. Uh, dissent in Ukraine came to the attention of Amnesty International at the end of the 1960s uh, through the publication of materials documenting violation of human rights in the Soviet Union. These materials were compiled by Vyacheslav Chornovil, at that time a young journalist working for a TV station in Lviv. The collection circulated in manuscript form and reached the West in the second part of the 1960s. Chernobyl's imaginative compilation of biographical sketches of arrested Ukrainian cultural activists, selections of their scholarly and creative works, labor camp correspondence, appeals to the Soviet authorities, Public appearances. Yes, fine. Yes, uh, public appearances of prominent literary figures like uh, Ivan Zuba's speech on the 25th anniversary of the tragedy at Babin Yar in Kyiv. Um, all these appeared uh, under the title Lichos Rozumu in 1967 in Paris. A year later, this collection was published uh, by an English publisher, I believe it was McGraw-Hill, under the title The Chernobyl Papers. The English edition created a stir in Western world and not only among people actively engaged in the defense of human rights. Courageous efforts of young men and women in Ukraine to protect their language and culture received high praise from Western scholars and political commentators. Max Hayward of London, for example, observed, the Ukrainian opposition is striking both for its moderation and high intellectual level. Frederick Barghorn of Yale University, in the introduction to the Chernobyl papers, called attention to what he saw as the community of interests among Soviet intellectuals of various national backgrounds, uh, saying, although the preservation of the Ukrainian cultural heritage and language are central features of the outlook of many young Ukrainian intellectuals, the latter perceive themselves as struggling not against Russian, the Russian nation, but rather against, the dicta against dictatorship and police state. Uh, these uh, characteristics, as well as their strict adherence to peaceful methods in expressing their protest assured the Ukrainian dissident of um, almost immediate acceptance as prisoners of conscience uh, by Amnesty International. Even those dissidents whose demands went beyond mere cultural rights, for example, those who campaigned for Ukraine's separation from Russia, um, or Soviet Union, uh, they envisaged uh, reaching this objective not through acts of violence, but rather through uh, by uh, le a legal process uh, um, as a um, calling attention to the right of Ukraine to separate from Russia in accordance with the existing uh, constitution. Uh, it was probably the impressive artistic talent of, paint, of the painter Opanaz Zalewacha, 
some of whose works were reproduced in Lejos Rosumu, as well as the cruelty of the artist's treatment in the labor camps that prompted the head of the newly formed American section of Amnesty International in Washington. Um, he was a great admirer of art, I was told at that time. Um, he selected Zalevacha as one of the first prisoners of conscience from the Ukrainian group of dissidents. It was, of course, taken for granted that any activity on behalf of Zalevacha would simultaneously be a defense of all the political prisoners, all the dissidents who were arrested on charges Okay, on charges of anti-Soviet uh, uh, propaganda. In the case of Zalevacha, I would like to explain that the artist was imprisoned for his political beliefs and not because he refused to conform to the standards of socialist realism in his artistic works or the norms of accepted style of Soviet life. The fact that he was arrested and then forbidden to paint in the labor camp was a penalty imposed on him for his political convictions as well as his readiness to defend, defend these political convictions even in prison. Uh, there is a line that should be drawn between what was and continues to be understood as dissidents that is readiness to risk one's career and even life in defense of firmly held political or religious beliefs, and the broader, somewhat more ambi ambiguous, ambiguous notion of nonconformism. All Ukrainian dissidents and all Russian dissidents of the 1960s and the 1970s adopted by Amnesty International fall into the category of prisoners of conscience, that is, dissidents. Placing them side by side with nonconformism or nonconformists distorts and trivializes somewhat their firm stand on the question of human rights. The dissidents, I think, could be uh, best compared to the Dominican monk who, in, at the beginning of the 16th century, nailed his 95 theses and firmly, stand, uh, firmly said, here I stand, I cannot act otherwise. To me, um, as a young student at that time, the dissidents on whose behalf uh, I was working at that time had very little in common with the long-haired, unwashed, and nonconformists, my next-door neighbors uh, living in East Village in the 1960s. In addition to Zalevacha, Amnesty International in the US also adopted a well-known Russian dissident Vladimir Bukovsky, already mentioned here twice. Besides the Washington Center mentioned above, the only other section of Amnesty uh, International in the US uh, was the Riverside Group here in New York. This cluster of about 15 human rights activists was tied, even though not officially, with Columbia University. Most of its members were either Columbia professors or um, Columbia University students. The head of uh, the amnesty at that time was uh, Professor Ivan Morris, the head of um, the Middle Eastern Institute here at Columbia, and another quite very well-known professor was Ainsley Embry, um, a specialist in Hindu studies. Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, even though he was not uh, officially within the group, he never attended the meeting, and I'm, it is my impression that uh, he was not acquainted with the leaders of uh, the Riverside group, but he always showed his readiness whenever he was approached by students to help 
in, um, to aid us in uh, publicizing uh, um, Ukrainian and Russian political prisoners. It was largely through his efforts that one of the, one of the documents from Lechus Rozumu was published um, in English for the first time even before uh, the Chernobyl papers appeared. And this was an appeal by Svetoslav Karavansky, an appeal on behalf of Ukrainian and Jewish uh, cultural rights, an appeal to the Soviet authorities. It appeared in the new leader, I believe in 1968 or 1969. Uh, be, being the only member of the Russian Institute, now the Harriman Institute in the Riverside Group at that time, uh, it was taken for granted that I would be working both on behalf of Zalevacha and Bukowski. Uh, Professor Embry, uh, I'm sorry, Embry also um, agreed to work on behalf of these two um, prisoners. And we agreed privately that he would be writing letters, signing them on behalf of Zalevacha, and I would do the same on behalf of Bukowski. Uh, in later years, especially after my trip in the Soviet Union, uh, in, um, to the Soviet Union in 1971, which ended with my, like um, Jerry's, official expulsion from uh, Kiev uh, because of my work uh, with Amnesty Interna International, I used pseudonyms uh, in my correspondence or I uh, worked very closely together with people who were officially uh, responsible for a particular case on a Soviet prisoner of conscience. For me and for my colleagues, most of us still in our 20s at that time, it was inspiring and deeply gratifying to get involved in the defense of these prisoners. We were impressed by the talent and unbending courage of the Ukrainian artist, Zalevacha. We were deeply moved by the strong convictions and bravery of Bukowski. I still remember vividly the impact on us of a secret interview with the Russian dissident aired on public television more, more than 40 years ago, I believe it was. How could one forget the determined expression on the face of a young man born into a family of privilege uh, uttering the words that would soon become the motto of human right, uh, rights activists throughout Eastern Europe? I'm quoting from memory. It is our determination to break the chains of fear that have been paralyzing our society. <clears throat> if these words have been um, indelible, uh, indelibly printed in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my memory, it is because they would be heard again and again in the capitals and major cities of Eastern Europe. In 1971, for example, while taking a brisk walk on the streets of Lviv, in, which Vyacheslav Chernobyl, after realizing that we were surrounded by secret agents and not two or three, but at least a dozen, I asked the seeming, seemingly unperturbed, high-spirited Ukrainian dissident, aren't you afraid I'm scheduled to leave for New York within a few days, but you and your friends, there were about six of us at that time. In a matter-of-fact tone, with the usual jovial expression on his face, uh, Chernobyl replied, please understand that we are above fear. In fact, it is our objective to break the chains of fear that are paralyzing our conscience, that are paralyzing our society. Our work in our work, we are strictly acting in accordance with the law. And here, I would slightly disagree with the periodization that Miroslav Marinovich gave us yesterday. Uh, from the very beginning, as far as the Ukrainian dissidents were concerned, they were acting openly. There's not a um, radical break with the formation of the Helsinki group. 
Helsinki group did not exist in the 60s. And, um, but they were acting on behalf of human rights and they were calling uh, in their appeals, they were uh, calling attention to the Declaration of Human Rights of the UN. Uh, this said, I'm uh, once again uh, going back to Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl resumed in his customary fast-paced manner the recitation of a list of the most recent human rights violations in Ukraine. His speech was occasionally in interrupted by a cough, uh, the consequence of forced feeding while he was on a hunger strike during his first imprisonment. Uh, after this manifestation of um, undaunted courage, by no means was I walking with a nonconformist. My only concern was to preserve in my memory the list of the most recent violations of human rights in Ukraine until I reached New York. In the evening of the same day, uh, Chernobyl managed to whisk from Ivano-Frankivsk, by no means a neighboring city, uh, Raisa Moroz, uh, who is sitting with us today, the wife of uh, the well-known dissident uh, Valentin Moroz, a prisoner incar incarcerated at that time in the notorious Vladimir pr prison. It was important for me to meet with Raisa because the second Ukrainian prisoner adopted by the Riverside Group was Valentin Moroz. It was the policy of the Riverside Group that <clears throat> at least at that time, that after a year of, or so of no apparent progress, the case would be set aside and a new prisoner, usually with a similar background, would be adopted. Uh, the group was preoccupied at that time with uh, uh, the violation of human rights in Greece uh, under the colonels, but at my request, uh, they agreed to continue with the Moros case. It was after this decision that in, the early 19, uh, that early in 1971, I contacted the Ukrainian community in New York uh, for assistance. Both the Ukrainian Daily Svoboda and as well as the Ukrainian Congress Committee uh, responded promptly and it was with their help that we organized a large demonstration on behalf of the Ukrainian prisoner of, on behalf of Moroz in front of the United Nations and the Soviet mission in the spring of that year. Moroz, as it has been mentioned already, became the symbol of perseverance of, um, um, uh, and, uh, um, in, in the area of human rights uh, in Ukraine. Soon, committees for defense of Moroz were organized in the United States and Canada. His writings, in particular his essay, Report from the Barrier Reserve and Among the Snows, received high praise for their intellectual acuity and vivid, realistic portrayal of the harshness of the Soviet prison system. The first essay, um, uh, Report from Barrier Reserve, um, was considered by some Western commentators as the most brilliant and, and analytically most penetrating work of all Soviet dissidents writing on the subject of KGB. One Western commentator wrote, and I quote, the incriminating power of the accusations and the incisive penetration into the psyche of the KGB reached the very bottom of one's soul. Moroz not only physically survived the lengthy incarceration and the 40-day hunger strike, even though not entirely unscathed, uh, as his subsequent uh, essays, writings sadly show, but he, um, after, after Vladimir prison, was sent to a labor camp and he survived that as well. In 1979, he was brought to the United States in a prisoner exchange thanks to the efforts of the above-named Columbia professor to whose attention we brought the cases of the Ukrainian prisoners um, that were listed in Lechos Rozumu um, more than 10 years earlier. 
Of course, I'm speaking about Zbigniew Brzezinski, who at that time was no longer at Columbia, but in Washington, a, a much more uh, important place as one of the advisors to President Carter. In the mid-1970s, amnesty groups mushroomed throughout the United States. At that time, I joined the Madison Group of dedicated people still functioning today as Group 11, and some members of the group are present here. I joined them partly because of the group's policy to continue working on individual cases until the prisoners in question were released and sometimes um, we worked on the case even longer to make sure that um, the former prisoners would be protected when they are at home. Um, the, the group was energetically and very ably led by Yadja Zeltman, who during my first visit informed me that they had adopted a Ukrainian nationalist, um, Zinovi Krasivsky. She noted that it was specifically emphasized in the case sheet received from the research department in London that the prisoner himself, as well as his friends, favored this designation. The Ukrainian poet's name was brought to the attention of Amnesty's London office by Viktor Feinberg and Anatoly Radigin, two former Soviet political prisoners who in 1974 had the good fortune to emigrate to Israel. Uh, Feinberg painted a vivid portrait of the Ukrainian prisoner and I will be quoting it in full. I would like to tell you about my first meeting with Krasivsky because this was not an ordinary meeting. This was the Serbsky Institute in the winter of 1972. At the fourth division directed by the infamous Dr. Lutz, Lutz there, was, there were several political prisoners of the most diverse political views. There was, for example, my friend and a wonderful human being, Václav Sivruk. He was a liberal Marxist. There was a young Moscow engineer who was incarcerated for a letter to Brezhnev, a typical Moscow liberal. There was the philosopher Devletov, a Tatar from Kazan. He considered himself a left communist, a very interesting individual and a courageous man. We conducted disputes and discussions. One day, a rumor was heard that a Ukrainian nationalist will be brought to the institute. One of the prisoners said, hmm, what am I going to discuss with a Ukrainian nationalist? But when Zinovi Krasivsky arrived, his very appearance, his manner of speech, the intonation of his voice elicited a sympathetic attitude. He conquered all from the first appearance. And whoever questioned what one could discuss with a Ukrainian nationalist would find it difficult to leave his room. Zinovi Mikhailovich Krasivsky became for us the highest authority on the question of ethics. Krasivsky was arrested in 1967 for his involvement in an organization known as the Ukrainian National Front. This group campaigned for Ukraine's independence, that is Ukraine's separation from the Soviet Union, as I have already mentioned, in accordance with the Constitution. The concept nationalist was understood by Krasivsky and his colleagues in its original pristine form. An individual who believed that every nationality had the right to self-determination or independence. This is the way that the word was used when I was still a student here at Columbia. Now it, uh, uh, it became a almost an unmentionable word because the word nationalist is equated immediately with fascist, which obviously is not right. The efforts of Group 11 on behalf of Krasivsky spanned over a decade and this perseverance, persistence, and ultimate success has been unique in the history of human, a human rights organization. 
the group's activities were largely responsible for keeping the prisoner alive in psychiatric prisons, labor camps, and the bleakness of exile in Siberia until the cracks of the Soviet system surfaced at the end of the 1980s. Another former inmate of Krasivsky, Yosef Mendelevich, who also emigrated to Israel, presents a picture of Krasivsky as we have seen him through this correspondence. More than 10 years of uh, uh, very frequent exchange of letters. We had wonderful people, hardworking people. It was, the group was somewhat different from the Riverside group in the sense that in addition to students and professors, we had musicologists, we had uh, housewives who were engaged in charity work, uh, who had more time than most of us who were working at that time, and letters were written that practically every week to Krasivsky. Among our members uh, was the recently deceased mother of um, uh, of um, Richard Holbrook, uh, Trudy Curl, uh, who was not only um, a fellow member, but also our close friend. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Richard Holbrook um, was, and as we have learned yesterday from the New York Times, uh, Richard Holbrook uh, was a mentor to Samantha Power, who occupies a very important position today in human rights in Washington. She apparently is a right hand uh, to uh, President Obama. So human rights that is, are in a very strong position today. Um, this is a quotation, another quotation um, from a fellow prisoner about Zinovi as, and it, I think it reflects so fully our view of him at that time. Zinovi often talked about the psychiatric prison and his listeners were often traumatized by the horrors he described. One needs to be a person with, uh, with nerves of steel, with a strong psych psychological state of mind and with a chaste soul in order to return, to return from there with an unskated mind and we know that very well. What is most striking about Zinovi is the integrity of his soul. Very soon, we learned that Zinovi has the ability to sense the most subtle tremors of the soul. A very good poet, whose poems were smuggled out of the Vladimir prison by my friend Yuri Vutka, who also immigrated to um, Israel. He could be both a poet and an astute political realist quite a rare combination of traits. To illustrate the point of political realism of uh, the Ukrainian dissident, uh, it uh, would be of interest to quote from a letter Krasivsky wrote already in Freedom in January of 1991. This is at, a at the time when the uh, former uh, Secretary of Ideology of the Communist Party, uh, Leonid Kravchuk became Ukraine's president. This is what, this is the observation by Zinovi. We all know that the Soviet state represented nothing but a state of usurpers. But we pretend that a democratic system can be constructed here, even a parliamentary form of struggle. Adherents of moderation do not want to recognize that they are falling in the direction of compromise and thus are permitting themselves to be led into a blind alley. By moderation, obviously, he meant um, um, moder moderation, he meant those who wanted to come, uh, come to terms with the former leaders of the Communist Party. Uh, Krasivsky's position, and initially it was the position of the Ruch, um, Chernobyl's position too, uh, was um, very similar to that in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, to the position of Václav Havel, who did not want to come to terms with Strugel uh, and Indra and Bilak at that time. 
Uh, my objective was to present uh, Ukrainian dissidents as they were seen by amnesty and by foreign observers. The question arises, who was responsible for the distorted pro portrait that was painted of them at the time when Ukraine was becoming independent. And I could cite instances of rumors that were circulating even here in the West. And that was the purpose of my question yesterday to um, Miroslav Marinovich. Uh, how do you account for the marginalization of the former dissidents. It's not just their fault. We have to look what was happening in the background. And this applies to Ukrainian prisoners, this applies to Sakharov in Russia. Yes, uh, President um, um, uh, Gorbachev may have greeted him, but what happened to Sakharov later? In addition to that, as far as the Ukrainian uh, dissidents are concerned, some of them died rather suddenly, in the early 1990s, one of them is uh, Zinovi Krasivsky, rather unexpectedly. Another one is his close friend, Yaroslav Lesiu, died in a car crash. And everybody, I think, knows um, the sad death of Yacheslav Chornovil. Even later, after the, the way they were discredited, they were, uh, uh, Yacheslav Chornovil was still dangerous to the leadership in Ukraine, and he had to be destroyed in a car accident, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a little over uh, half an hour for discussion, and then, uh, because our session was a little longer, uh, Mr. Vyatarovich, uh, you may remember yesterday, uh, uh, Professor Maranovich mentioned uh, uh, Mr. Vyatarovich's role in making documents available from the KGB SBU archives and would like to present a little information on an interesting document uh, he has on the dissident movement. Um, and then uh, uh, I think our panel today will be returning to history again. We're going to go around in circles. But what I find very interesting is that these various histories, we have the history of the dissident movement, we have the history then of the defense of the dissidents that occurred here, and then the history of the various communities involved, for some of us personal histories as, as they were. What strikes me very much as someone as well to a degree uh, living through these times and active, I know that I'm an academic today because of the dissidents. That is my activities as a student at Princeton in the 1960s that drew me to a bachelor's paper that dealt with the dissidents would have never happened without Likos Rosamo coming out as it did. Uh, I think in many ways, when we talk about their long-term impact, dealing, although I do not argue this is a central issue, uh, I think to a considerable degree the activity certainly of the Ukrainian and other communities for another generation, Lithuanian and other such groups, occurred to a great degree because of the dissident movement. Uh, that is, voices could be stilled to a certain degree within the countries, and yet they strangely enough had a tremendous impact on these diaspora communities who then in a later time are able to recycle ideas back in. So we've got many, many very complex <laughs> problems and various focuses. Now I ask everyone giving questions to please go to the microphone and identify yourself. This will help for the taping of this. Uh, questions and comments, please. Kipuzinski, University of Toronto. I, I think Frank actually pointed out something incredibly important which was revealed in all three of your papers. What is being done to document the personal stories such as yourselves and there were so many hundreds like you in all the various national groups participating uh, in terms of oral interviews, collecting of memoirs and the like. Uh, aside from a personally taking responsibility in writing a book such as you have done. Uh, as far as we are concerned, Amnesty International Group 11, uh, we immediately, when it was possible to publish um, in Ukraine, handed uh, copies of our correspondence with Krasivsky to Mr. Marinovich, and uh, this collection was published. We also have translated uh, and prepared for public publication in English, and uh, we 
are looking for a publisher. If anyone is willing to help us here in the United States, we do have a publisher in Ukraine, but we would like to publish it here. Um, so this is our way of uh, publishing them, and uh, we have an excellent archivist, Ruth Barron, who is here with us. <laughs> Uh, who has been documenting uh, the work of Group 11 from its very beginning. Well, um, in addition to the book I published, which was my way of documenting our work, uh, all of the files of Human Rights Watch are, are in an archive here at Columbia. And uh, all my notes and everybody else's notes are all going to end up there. So. My book will come out hopefully at the end of this year, and um, uh, it does document the 25 years that the World Congress has uh, worked on uh, on defensive dissidents, and and many other uh, things as as well as uh, I think it's important to to put uh, um, into some kind of context uh, the um, <coughs> the international. For as well, uh, because they have contributed much. Um, Amnesty, I must say, the Amnesty groups that I've worked with, um, there are archives. Uh, a lot of them have uh, wound up in, in Ottawa, uh, but minimally. There, for some reason, in, in Canada, archival material is not very valued, uh, nor is it in, in our Ukrainian community. Um, uh, the archives that I have are in my own home, and if somebody would like to take them off my hands, I would <laughs> uh, give you a blessing and, and bless the archives too. Um, you have a deal, the University of Toronto. Yes, I, yes, I can. I yes. can see that. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, now let's see if you give them. Oh, <laughs> okay. You have within six months. <laughs> okay. uh, we have a lot of archival material amongst the dissidents. I know that the Hrohorenko archives, uh, Nadika Svitlitschna and I were going to work on them. I promised to come to her house, and then she became very ill, and that was impossible, and that now has traveled to Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, so Svetoslav might, might have some archives and so on. But. Uh, Bill Risch, Georgia College uh, in Milledgeville, Georgia. Uh, I was very impressed by all three presentations. My two questions would be of a historiographical nature. Um, it was very interesting, you know, because many of you are from the Ukrainian diaspora and you interact with these Ukrainian political prisoners. How did those interactions with political prisoners change your perceptions of Ukraine, Ukrainian history? Because as, as um, Professor Prozik mentioned, you know, the, the idea of a Ukrainian nationalist was, uh, you know, could be equated with fascism for many people, but this perspective on Krasivsky would change people's minds about that, perhaps. And uh, the question I have uh, for the second presenter, it was very interesting how you mentioned uh, gender. It seemed like there were so many women involved in the dissident movement in Moscow and in other cities. How, how do you see the, the women playing a special role in this movement and in what really is a transnational history, if you think about it, crossing the, the, the barriers of the Cold War. Thanks. Uh, with respect to um, the first question, and that is how did our perception change? Uh, I would say that uh, when Krasinski was adopted, this was 1974, and at that time the word nationalist was not as yet a dirty word. In other words, it was understood in a different way and interpreted than it is understood today. Um, and, um, uh, but obviously, through correspondence with him and also through the description of him by his fellow prisoners, many of them of whom were either of Jewish or Russian background, we did get a better perception of uh, what a Ukrainian nationalist was. That it was not what the Russians tried to present them to be. Not so much the Russians, I'm sorry, the Soviets tried to present them uh, to be. Um, our perception, um, well, here perhaps I would like to add 
that after ten, more than 10 years of correspondence, and I was translating the letters because for a long time I was the only one who spoke Ukrainian, and Krasivsky wrote in Ukrainian, uh, the moments that I remember best is when we ha had our monthly meetings and we were reading his letters. We became a family. And Krasivsky, uh, our backgrounds were different, but we became a family. That is. Uh, and Krasivsky was um, holding us together. It was a beautiful moment. I wish I could describe it in words, but I'm not a poet. Um, uh, the second question, I don't recall, but perhaps somebody else will mention. For me, um, the word nationalism uh, came as a jolt uh, when I was very, very young in Baltimore. Uh, I was working with uh, Zinkevich and the small skip people, and we had to ferret um, information coming in from the, from the Soviet Union and um, translate it, put it into, into um, uh, printed printing form in the old Gestetner, Gestetner machines and so on. And when I came across it, it wasn't vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, 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 the Russian uh, connotation. It was vis-a-vis -vis the, the Americans with whom I uh, uh, associated. And um, the way I dealt with it was that um, what, what to you is national, uh, what to you is patriotism, to, to me is nationalism. And how uh, nationalistic is it to, to take out a, an American flag and, and wave it uh, uh, on the 4th of July? Uh, that's, that could be nationalism, but, but it's patriotism we, we all embrace. So uh, that question was, was not a difficult one. Um, the, I've, there, was a, there was a second part. Gender. 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 Oh, yeah. the, the women. The women. Uh, the women. I, I will pass on to you. <laughs> well, it, it's been my observation in general, and and in my organization, Human Rights Watch, in particular, that there seems to be a disproportionate number of women who are drawn to the human rights cause. It may just be a coincidence that there are three of us presenting today, but as far as the uh, meeting with the Moscow group is concerned. The men were all gone. They'd all been arrested, and that's why the people who were left at that point were women and people who were old, presumably too old to be arrested, although it turned out even that was not true. And then uh, just before I let her speak, just two comments. One on the nationalism. Remember in the 1960s in a country like Canada, nationalism was a left movement, a left anti-imperial movement in Canada directed largely at what was seen as hegemony from the United States and other forces. So in terms of whether these things are left, right, and where they stand on the political spectrum, uh, I think are very interesting. And then on the second of how this, what this impact had, I, I, I mentioned this in, in a considerable degree. I think that the dynamism of the Ukrainian community for at least the next 30 years came out of the dissident movement. That is, had it not existed, had a generation in the 1960s not had direct contact with Ukraine, but it only depended on the world of their parents and grandparents or of their youth, the Ukrainian community would have gone a very different way. The Ukraine then became real because of the dissident movement and the activities. And then as to what it meant for Ukrainian studies, uh, I know in my own personal experience when I did do this large, very large bachelor's thing at the, at the Woodrow Wilson School at, at Princeton, uh, my professors, Kassoff and Billington and Black, had all been very nice in, in uh, letting me do it. But then I found out years later, someone had written, I got quite a very nice grade, they, I think, objectively reviewed it. But someone wrote, amazingly objectively written for someone so recently from Ukraine. In my case, <laughs> my great-grandparents came from Ukraine. But it also <laughs> gives you the feeling of how things particularly and part of that was the observation of Russian studies as it developed, and this issue difficult, and the, or the Ukrainian issue, I think, the most difficult, the Baltic one less difficult, but difficult to deal with. And part of it was this assumption of whether these activities uh, bore any, any relevance to what was Soviet studies of the 1960s, when many people viewed the nationality problem as solved in the Soviet Union. If you ask people in 1960, they 
moved on, and only some fringe groups didn't believe in this. No, no, excuse me for this. I would like to thank uh, all the three speakers, but I have only two co comments. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anna Protzik for very important correction. Uh, I agree that human rights, uh, the idea of human rights was in the center, in the core of any dissident activity, no matter what period uh, we take into consideration. Uh, so uh, I would now r rephrase my fourth uh, period as that of uh, Helsinki movement. And probably that would be uh, correct. Thank you for very important correction and I apologize for the <coughs> mistake. Uh, then, before I make uh, my sec second uh, comment, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Kristina uh, Isayev to, to help me. Uh, did you say that uh, General uh, Gregorenko didn't work for rus uh, Russification issue? Because I didn't hear properly. Yes, that was not, that was not his main, uh, that was not his main issue. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not. Yeah. He denied it, yes, uh, because because of his background. But then he he strongly emphasized uh, the, the issue of genocide of, of the Ukrainian people, which you know. Um, is yeah. That. Yeah, uh, um, I agree that it was not in the very center of his activity at some stages. But it's important Im important that uh, I saw some. Uh, development, some, uh, uh, some transfer, some, some uh, dynamism in, in the uh, understanding of the national issue uh, of, uh, and I would like to give uh, some importance, uh, important uh, witness, uh, as I suggest. Um, I remember that General Gregorenko sent uh, a tel telegram to me, uh, and uh, then he found out that this telegram was um, translated from Ukrainian to Russian. Uh, but according to the Soviet law, if uh, uh, some text is written in Cyrillic, then it is okay. It may be sent even without translation. So he. Um, it was real a scandal because he wrote very resolute, very uh, energetic letter complaining about uh, that uh, fact, this voluntarism of the post. So I would, last, I would like just to tell that uh, story. Thank you. Thank you. He was, a, first of all, a patriot. Um, he could uh, analyze very well the problems of, of uh, the dissidents, uh, the, the uh, KGB, um, uh, the, the repressive organs and, and, and what was happening. Um, it was just that initially he had, he had his own commitments as a military man. And uh, in, in, the first, uh, in our first meetings of, of him, of his writings, uh, this is what came forth. Um, but when, once he was here, he, we worked on, on so many issues. We went to Washington uh, for hearings, and he came across as, as a, um, a very firm patriot uh, uh, who did not deny nationalism in, in, in any sense of the word. Uh, if I could briefly add to support uh, Mr. Maranovich's um, uh, um, point of view, um, we invited General Horenko to Group 11 meetings, and he helped us um, um, to, in support to gain the defense of uh, the Ukrainian nationalist Krasinski. My name is Yuri Dobchansky from Washington, D.C. Um, as Professor Sisson pointed out, uh, many of us were personally influenced by the dissident movement. Uh, sometimes it was a life-changing uh, situation. In my case, I moved to Washington to work for the original Moroz Committee, Moroz Defense Committee, back in 1975. After 
the committee had been in, in, in uh, active for about a year. I remained a member of that committee until 76, sometime in 76 when it had to fold because uh, it just wasn't viable. Um, what I'd like to ask you is uh, we became, we were an ad hoc group. It was started back in the summer of 74 as a group of uh, hunger strikers that were in front of the Soviet embassy. Uh, there were two or three shifts of hunger strikers. My future wife actually took, play, took part in that hunger strike. Um, and when we, when we eventually try to incorporate ourselves to become a, a viable group to have financial support, to, mind you, this was, it really dwindled down to four individuals at one point back in the early 76. Uh, we had really no means of support. When we appealed to the various central organizations in the Ukrainian diaspora community, we were viewed, in a sense, as dissidents. We were nonconformists because we weren't working through central channels. And we turned the argument around and said, we are in Washington. We are at the center of political power. We are trying to do concrete things. We are trying to get resolutions passed. We are trying to get concrete help to the dissidents. Somehow that fell on deaf ears. It was more of a symbolic politics that was really at the core of the community's efforts at that time. Later, it, it evolved. But what I'm saying is back in, 19, in the early, mid-70s, it was still the symbolic politics of demonstrations, hunger strikes, as you mentioned before. Uh, how many also shared this, how many of the speakers also shared this uh, certain dissidence, sort of dissident stand? I call it uh, the nonconformist um, position. How many of you felt that from the you know, central organizations? When Senator Yuzik asked me to join, um, I joined as a volunteer because I had already been coordinating uh, amnesty uh, uh, groups, Soviet uh, adoption groups. Um, I, was the, I was the enemy within the, within the World Congress of Free Ukrainians. There were some 232 organizations and representatives from all over the world came. And um, because I wanted to work exclusively on the issue of human rights, I saw, I saw no possibility to work on any other issues other than perhaps uh, the Catholic Church, and then I would have had to have gotten es experts to, wa to, to work with me, or on the Baptists, or, you know, uh, had I fractured my work, um, I would have gotten some community um, support. But as it was, human rights was not a very popular way to, to work. Um, uh, I, don't remember, I don't know if you remember Igor Bielinski, who was one of the prominent members of, of one of the uh, large organizations. Uh, and again, it was money, it was community support, and it was uh, a permanent office that, that needed for that kind of coalition. Uh, Igor Vilinsky would, would look at my reports um, in the beginning as I worked and said that, oh, Christino, this is, this is invaluable, this is wonderful. But there's one thing that cannot be. There's not a word about national rights. Everything is human rights. And we do not derive uh, uh, personal rights from, uh, from some nebulous human rights. And I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing him uh, but almost, uh, the individual's rights come from the nation. And, and I would go ballistic at that point. Uh, and so this, this was, uh, uh, yes, we were, we were outsiders until, um, until this World Congress uh, gave me that position and I, and I, um, I belabored it for many years. Well, that, that kind of uh, links up with the idea of nationalism and the human rights movement. Uh, to non-Ukrainians, we were nationalists. Hmm. To the Ukrainian community, we were human rights activists. And this was also a, sort of a distancing uh, measure. Uh, the Ukrainian community did not want to perceive human rights as a legitimate cause. No. I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing now. The Ukrainian community in general uh, didn't perceive human rights as a basic uh, thing worth working for. So that's, I'm, I'm yeah. glad you agree.
Uh, I had very little difficulty with the Ukrainian Congress Committee and with the Ukrainian paper Svoboda. Uh, they immediately uh, came to our aid. And as some of you may remember, Moroz's uh, photo was every day on the first page of Svoboda during his hunger strike. So um, I myself did not experience that. First to Dr. Asayev, I'm interested in the uh, um, something you had brought up, the attitude of the Western Europeans uh, during the, on, on, on the issue of human rights uh, during the 70s and 80s. You, I, if I didn't, wasn't mistaken, you seem to have a less than flattering characterization of their commitment to it as opposed to what we were hearing out of Canada, the United States. The reason why I ask that is because I'd like you to do a little bit of comparative uh, so that we can have a contemporary sense of it. Uh, given the fact that the Western Europeans, and I've run a lot of conferences in the last 10 years on that issue, Western European reaction to the pre-Orange Revolution period, the Orange government's even attention to, East, uh, to EU membership, and even the return to the authoritarian tendencies in Ukraine lately, um, you do not get the kind of commitment, or at least we've been perceiving that the commitment from Western Europeans is not the kind of commitment we're getting from Eastern Europeans, certainly, and the United States and Canada, uh, again. So I'd like you to be able to comment on that. And second, uh, turning to both Ms. Uh, Ms. Labor and Dr. Krotzik, um, I'm going to come back to the question I asked yesterday, and that's why I'm going to move myself, but I am doing a work now on Solidarność, Kolokowski and Solidarność. Um, and uh, Mr. Vujic is here. Uh, he's an example of what I'm about to ask. It is interesting that in Poland and in Czechoslovakia, those that had been dissidents, that uh, members of core or eventually Charter 77 and so on, eventually rose to very, very prominent positions in their societies, even, in, in, uh, even though they had been part of the East Bloc. Uh, so in Czechoslovakia, in Poland and so on. There seems to be a very different pattern that's emerged in, in Ukraine and Russia. And I'm beginning to notice it. And I'm going to ask <laughs> Dr. Prozik, because I think she was rather, um, she stressed it, so I, I'm going to get as provocative as she nearly got. Uh, and that is interesting that something happened in the 90s. And I'm doing a pair of comparison with solidarity and what, where solidarity was eventually able to go. Um, and, and Havel's political uh, groupings. And what happened with the dissidents in the 90s in Ukraine? Now, we know that Chernobyl may have taken a, a, a very high political profile. But, I'm, but you've just reminded me, Ms. Labor, when you talked about Bukowski and so on and so forth, same thing with you, Dr. Prozik, uh, that in both Russia and Ukraine, in the 90s, they seemed to, with that enormous moral authority they had, I mean, greater authority than even what happened in Poland because there was a mass movement behind some of what's going on. But here are these folks with enormous moral authority. They suddenly, in the 90s, do not, are not able to plug into the Narod, whether it's in Ukraine or in Russia, they're not able to. That then suggests that there are other forces at work, or have been, uh, and may still be, and I've I had asked Dr. Maranovich about this. I will address it, and I promise I won't ask this question again. So again, first to uh, Dr. Isayu about Western Europeans, and then second to both Ms. Labor and Dr. Protzik about dissidents uh, and the comparative studies approach. You have to remember that the Helsinki Accords deals with three very different issues, uh, the military, the, the uh, economic, and because some countries wanted it, the, the human dimension. It was incumbent upon the United States and to a certain extent Canada supported it to, to push the human dimension of the human rights forward. Europeans really were very reluctant in the, in the very beginning, uh, except for the Brits. The, the, the British delegation came on full force from, from 1980 from Madrid on. Um, NGO input, and, and we were working as, as NGOs, 
uh, was not legitimized until, until much later. In Madrid, uh, we worked only through, I think it was Max Kampelman who was head of the delegation at, at that point, um, because he was a nice man and because he, he wanted us there. And, um, but beyond that, we, we would have not been allowed. So slowly, th this was an evolutionary process as well within uh, Helsinki um, uh, process, uh, the, an evolutionary process with the human rights um, agenda. But as, as the Soviets' uh, repressions grew, and they grew tremendously, as um, uh, uh, glasnost and perestroika were pronounced, and, and I expounded briefs upon briefs how it's only on paper and, and we are seeing nothing, and our dissidents were getting additional seven to 10 years imprisonment sentences on top of what they had already served, the impetus uh, took up. And so um, the, uh, the British, the, the, the Danes, the Scandinavians then came through uh, until the late 80s when uh, we were actually asked to present briefs to, to, to help them out. Uh, I received many letters in, in my office asking what do I have as latest reports on such and such a dissident uh, because they want to raise him. It even came to the very wonderful, interesting point in the last uh, Vienna, uh, Bern, uh, Copenhagen to, to some extent, leading up to Moscow, we were all very wary about Moscow and the human dimension and what would we do there in, in Moscow with all, still all the, all the, all the uh, repressions um, in place. Um, there came a point where even the European, uh, European delegations would come to us and say, okay, um, the Brits are working on the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Uh, we'd like to get some information on the psychiatric uh, prisoners right now. And let's see if you can talk to the Danes if they want to raise the issue of, of Camp 36, which was a horrendous, horrendous camp where there were so many. So um, it was all an evolution, slowly. But, but, um, Without a doubt, the, the, um, uh, the, the most uh, uh, rigorous uh, campaign was, was led by the United States. Now, do you have anything you to these to last question that you'd like um, to say? Yes. yes. Um, well, thank you for asking you. that question. I um, stress that um, in particular because when I was working on my book, I was working in the White Army's archives at the Hoover Institution and dealt uh, a great deal with secret services of the White Army and how important it was for them during the Ukrainian Revolution to defame the Ukrainian leaders. And they were very active in that. And I sense, I did not study the archives, but I sense a very similar um, development with respect to the Ukrainian dissidents. Just to give you an example with respect to Vyacheslav Chernovil during uh, the elections for presidency. Um, uh, there were speakers at our academic institutions here in New York that would, well, you know, Chernobyl, yes, he's a fine fellow, but he bought a house, etc., etc., in Lviv. So there was always this but. Um, there, uh, I meet uh, a member of um, a Ukrainian community who was working in the um, um, who was familiar with the human rights uh, movement and with the defense of Ukrainian dissidents. And his comment is, oh, it would be a, a tragedy if Chernobyl would become the president, because then we would have a war with Russia. And I'm asking him, on what basis are you saying this? Don't you know how um, close he was to non-Ukrainian uh, dissidents um, he wrote uh, uh, appeals together with Jewish prisoners uh, of conscience and with Russians. On what basis are you making the statement? The response was, well, everybody is saying this. And then, uh, during that time, uh, a woman, a simple woman who, uh, from Ukraine, who was doing menial work here, and I, when I asked her for whom she's going to vote, I'm not going to vote for Chernobyl, 
because his wife is Polish. They had, that is. Um, so they were very actively cam campaigning in order to undermine their positions. And the best example, I think, is uh, George Bush's Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, where did he get that information? Who were his advisors to present uh, Ukrainians as ultra-nationalists? So um, uh, I thank you for, for the question. And this is something that needs to be investigated. Uh, if they did not have influence, sufficient influence, it's not only uh, because they could not reach the masses. They were willing to reach the masses, but there were forces that were preventing them from it. The situation in Russia is somewhat different. One of the big questions, really big questions, is what would have happened, what might have happened if Sakharov had not died when he did. Um, a lot of people um, think that events in Russia might have taken a different course, but I'm not quite sure he was already being ostracized at the point of his death. Um, and the people like Sakharov and Kovalyov and others who went into government right after the changes were eventually marginalized. Um, I think it has to do, if you want to compare Russia to Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, I should say, and uh, Hungary, uh, although things aren't perfect in those countries either, I think that Russia has really moved backwards uh, in a way that the other countries haven't, and therefore it's a much harder road to hoe for people like, dis you know, the former dissidents have no place really in the government. My name is Peter Ridaway, and I'm an emeritus professor of political science at George Washington University. Um, I was uh, interested in the question by a previous questioner as to whether uh, there has been any systematic effort to document activities by supporters in the West of various dissident movements in uh, the Soviet Union and, uh, and other parts of Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, I'm glad that part of the answer comes from this panel who have done their, done their bit and are continuing to do their bit in doing that documentation. But having said that, I don't think that there has actually been any systematic effort made so far. And I hope we'll have a further opportunity in the next panel to discuss this. Um, but the next panel may want to focus primarily on uh, archives in the countries uh, that we are studying, Soviet Union and elsewhere. Uh, so I just thought I'd make a, f a couple of quick comments here now. And the first one has been implied by what some people have said already, but I'd like to really bring it out, which is that activities in the West are not, were not just activities by Westerners. They were activities by Westerners acting jointly in many cases with former dissidents, who you don't necessarily need to call them former. Uh, they just changed their location from Soviet Union or Poland or wherever to the West. And uh, in my own personal activities, uh, I just began to jot down a few names. So the, the numbers that I personally worked with closely uh, is 12 or 15. And that's not just once or twice, that's systematically. And uh, Bukowski, Tielnikov, Karyagin, Feinberg, Plusch, Borichanska, Tilesin uh, in the United States with uh, Pavel Litvinov, who's going to be here later, uh, Velevi Celidze, the creation of Kronika Press as an organization here, putting out regular publications. These were joint works between dissidents and Westerners. And how that, how that worked, how it played out, what impact it had, uh, is a very interesting topic on which, to the best of my knowledge, nothing systematic has yet been done. Uh, memoirs, of course, are one, one way, and it's admirable. Uh, Robert Van Voren has also published a couple of volumes. Um, I have thought about doing the same myself, probably will. Um, but we have archives, and I personally um, were not, was not approached 
uh, by any library for my archive. Uh, however, I took the initiative. Um, George Washington University was interested, so my archive uh, is in the process of being transferred to them, um, which, 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 which is good. Um, <coughs> on the question of whether the issue was raised whether Europe or North America were more responsive to various distant activities in, uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. I would just like to very quickly record my own experience, which is that in the early years, late 60s and in the 70s, Europe was, basically speaking, well ahead of North America. Uh, this was for a variety of reasons. Um, I was particularly active in the psychiatric abuse field. And just to give an example, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK spoke up first strongly and clearly against abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union in 1973. As an equivalent act did not happen in the United States for three years after that. Uh, once the United States and, and North America as a whole got moving, they of course played a very important role. But in a number of respects, one of them I think was that Amnesty International was based in London from 1961 onwards. That helped uh, in Europe. Uh, but Europe was, was, was in general, in my experience, ahead in the early years, at least. Um, a final point in case I don't get a chance to make it this afternoon. Uh, on the question of archives, systematic collection, um, it's partly up to the archivists to speak up and to announce that they would like to acquire archives. And I think that would put into the minds of a number of scholars and other human rights activists in the West that there is a demand. Um, and they might, you know, that might save some valuable archives being thrown out in the trash when folks like I depart the scene. Thank you. An interesting affirmation that Britain is Europe. Mr. Uh, excuse me, my English is bad, but I'll try to explain interesting things. I want to say about the names, Names Committee. First name of our committee, it wasn't uh, the name of Committee to Defense uh, Human Rights, Helsinki. First, our name was Committee to Defense the Worker. It was first committee. Why? It wasn't an accident. It was a choice. It was conscious choice. Because during two months since uh, July to September 76, the group of young people are going to workers to help them because they were persecuted after strike. And in September 76, all the people, our, the famous uh, Professor Lipinski, Jerzy Andrzejewski, the novelist, yeah, uh, and other, decided to organize committee. And they proposed the name, normal name, Committee to Advance Human Rights. But we say, when I am going to the work, and I am, I, I say, I am the member of committee to, the, to defend the human rights. He asked, what is this? I don't understand, what, what do you want? But when I am, I, I am saying, I am the member of committee to, def to defend the worker, yes, I understand, you, you want to defend me, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and finally, uh, the name of this committee was Committee to Defense the Worker. It was choice. Uh, that, but, paradoxically, after half a year, in 1977, in Poland, it was organized new committee. It was not committee, but the, the movement. Movement to Defense Human Rights. Human Rights. Human and Civil, uh, so human and civil Rights, yes. In March 77. It was organized, but the group of people, but another uh, who, uh, to, who, uh, who wants to uh, use Helsinki Act to organize uh, an, uh, opposition, but they group were more patriotic, more patriotic in the sense of uh, uh, traditional Polish uh, connected with uh, army, Armia Krajowa in, during the uh, Second World War, more nationalist also, 
Uh, but the name is not uh, all. The name is only uh, the name. This, this group was, the, the, they, they had the name Committee to Defense uh, Human Rights and Civil, but uh, we had uh, the name Committee to Defense the Worker, but we were, we were more leftist, more uh, uh, open <laughs> than that. Uh, in Czechoslovak, in uh, uh, January 77, they organized uh, Carta 77, Chart 77. It was uh, also to defense persecuted by intellectual, because it was uh, the uh, committee to defense uh, rock music uh, people who organized uh, the group Plastic uh, People of Universe, the group of rock, uh, uh, rock, uh, I don't know, that's, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yes, group, uh, group. And if you, you see, was the difference on the, the beginning and difference in the result. We defense the worker. Our uh, direction was to go to the people, to worker, to after, to also to farmers. And our di direction was to organize more massive movement. They in Czechoslovakia organize more intellectual. Uh, movement, and result was that uh, uh, we had, after solidarity with the leader of Aueza, the worker, <laughs> they had Havel, very good people, very famous, intellectual, but only intellectual movement. And the beginning is, uh, uh, the beginning uh, of the way is uh, uh, show the direction and result, finally result. Yes, of course, no, it's just, that is all. <laughs> we will say about this after uh, afternoon more. Thank you. And documents which are import important source for researching the dissident movement. This uh, documents uh, partially are stored in uh, in the security service uh, archives in Ukraine. Uh, I say it uh, partially partially because a lot of these documents uh, were destroyed uh, at the end of uh, Soviet times of uh, Soviet era. In July uh, of uh, 1990, the headquarters of uh, KGB issued an order to destroy a lot of uh, documents from uh, 1960s to 80s. Incidentally, uh, the destroyed documents were of uh, KGB fifth department, which was created uh, to fight with uh, ideological subversion, namely, namely dissident movement. For example, uh, there was a complete uh, destruction of the documents uh, concerning the operation coded block. This operation started in, in uh, 1971 and uh, continued to until uh, 1986. It's a multi-volume case contain, contained files about dissident activity and uh, KGB counter operations. Uh, the only way we know about this operation is uh, from KGB summary, uh, summary reports to the Central Committee uh, of the Communist Party of Ukraine. Uh, over 700 uh, such reports were found, uh, found in uh, 2009 in, security in the Security Service Archive of Ukraine. In these archives, uh, there are also other interesting documents about, uh, dissid about dissidents. Uh, there are criminal cases on uh, Vasil Stus, Vyacheslav Chornovil, Ivan Zubay, Johannes Versuk, Ivan Svetlachny, and uh, more others. Um, uh, useful information about, about uh, operation against uh, dissident can be found in uh, specialized publications by the uh, KGB uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky Ac Academy in, in Moscow. I think the, the access to those documents could help clarify many important moments in the history of uh, uh, Ukrainian dissident movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our panelists and thank Mr. Vitroy for our chance to talk more at 1.30 when we reassemble about archives. And I think that uh, Dr. Andrejcik has a bit now.